Hi everybody, thank you for coming to my channel, Ronnie's Bible Study, and uh, I'd like to continue the beautiful part about the Lord says about the uh, Romans 6. Uh, I think I am, I stopped last time about uh, Paul speak uh, of this in Philippians 2. 11 12 where he says wherefore my beloved as you have always obeyed not as in my presence only but now much more in my absence right uh, carry to it ultimate goal your own salvation with fear and trembling for God is the one who is constantly supplying you the impulse giving you both the power to resolve and the strength to perform his good pleasure. And I think I also mentioned it's also being said in a way in uh, Philippians 2.10. This truth Paul present in verse 3 and 4, where we all taught that all believers were baptized into Jesus Christ and thus shared his death in order that they also might share his resurrection life. We look first at the phrase, baptized into Jesus Christ. It is set in a context of supernaturalism. In verse 2, we have the supernatural act of God breaking the power of indwelling sin for the believer. In verse 4, we have the supernatural act of God imparting divine life to the believer. Verse 3 reaches back to the action spoken of in verse 2 and forwards to that spoken of in verse 4. We were baptized into Jesus Christ so that we might be baptized into his death on the cross in order that through our identification with him in that death we might die with reference to sin that is have the power of indwelling sin broken we were also baptized into his death so that we might share his burial and thus his resurrection and in that way have his divine life imparted to us. Thus this baptism accomplished two things. It resulted in the power of sin being broken and the divine nature being implanted which, oper which operation took place at the moment the believer placed his faith in the Lord Jesus. Therefore, since the results were operative in the believer the moment he was saved, the baptism into Jesus Christ in which that person shared his death, burial, and resurrection must have taken place potentially previous to his being saved and actually at the moment of salvation. It's a very important point, folks, if you really listen and read the scriptures, because, as you know, there is a teaching about baptism, okay? And many people ask the question, is it necessary to be baptized to be saved? Okay, we'll go a little further. Our Lord died, was buried, and arose around 2,000 years ago. In the mind and reckoning of God, each believer was in Christ then, in order that he might, when he believed, participate in the benefits which his death, burial, and the resurrection brought forth. Therefore, the baptism referred to here is not 
water baptism, but the baptism by means of the Holy Spirit. And you can read it in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Let it be said in passing that the writer believes in the ordinance of water baptism, ob uh, obligat uh, obligatory upon all believers on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, that it is their testimony to the fact of their salvation, and he finds plenty of uh, spiritual warrant for it elsewhere. No ceremony of water baptism ever introduced a believer's sin, a sinner, into vital union with Jesus Christ. Let me read it again because this is a little bit hard sometimes for me to uh, express, okay? No ceremony, ceremony of water baptism ever introduced a believing sinner into vital union with Jesus Christ. Furthermore, many true children of God never have fulfilled their obligation of testifying to their salvation in water baptism and who is prepared to deny that they have been united to Christ. Paul is concerned here with the supernatural working of God resulting in an inner change in the spiritual mechanism of the believer's life and as a clear thinker who stays within the compass of his subject. Paul does not introduce the symbol where the supernatural alone is in view. But how are we to understand the word baptism? This word is the spelling of an English letter equivalent of the word uh, baptisma, the verb of the same term being baptizo. The Greek word has two distinct uses, the mechanical one and the ritualistic one, to be determined by the context in which it is found, since the word baptism is only the spelling of the Greek word uh, bapti baptisma, and not a word native to the English language. It has no meaning of its own, and therefore must derive its meaning from the Greek word of which it is spelling. Furthermore, it must be interpreted and translated in its two meanings, just as the Greek word is. We will present usage of the Greek word as found in Classical Greek and in the Koine Greek of secular documents, the Septuagint and the New Testament. And here he mentioned different uh, theologians, okay, uh, about for the following an instance of the purely mechanical use of baptizo in classical Greek. He said, I am indebted to my honor, and then he mentioned over here uh, Professor John Scott, you know, a PhD uh, from the classical Greek scholar, and then you have another one over here from Homer, the unity of Homer, okay? So here he mentioned, so he's not the only one who make this statement and who have believed it, okay? Uh, so when you, when you go back all the way down with the uh, in history, that uh, where we got the, 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 the word baptism from, okay? The first use of baptizo is in the ninth book of the Odyssey, where the hissing of the burning eye of the uh, cyclops is compared to the sound of water while a smith dips, okay, or baptizes a piece of iron, tempering it. Uh, in the battle of the uh, frogs and mice, it is said that a mouse thrust a frog with a reed, and the frog leaped over the water, baptizing it 
with its blood. Euripides used the word of a ship which goes down in the water and does not come back to the surface. Lucian dreamed that he has seen a huge bird shot with a mighty arrow and as it flies high in the air it baptized the clouds with its blood. An ancient uh, scholium of to the fifth uh, book of the I'll I I I I pronounce the word. I let uh, makes a wounded soldier baptize the earth with his blood. It is the ordinary word for staining or dying, and words derived from its meaning. Dying and dies are common. The most common meaning is to plunge into a liquid, but is so com uh, common in other meanings, that in each case the meaning must be determined by the context. And here we have, uh, in the Anabasis, okay, we have an instance where the word baptizo has both a mechanical and a ceremonial meaning. Before going to war, the Greek soldiers plays of baptizo the point of their sword, and the barbarians the point of their spears in a bowl of blood. Uh, in secular documents of the Kone uh, period, Malton and Milligan report of the following, to a, submer a submerged boat, ceremonial uh, ablutions, a person overwhelming in calamities, a person baptizo under the head, upon the head. So all these different examples they have in history, okay, and the meaning of the word in Greek. We have in Le 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 Leviticus uh, 4, 6, the word, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, where dip is from baptizo, and Sprinkle is from Rantiso in the Septuagint. The first referring to the action of introduction, the finger into the blood, and the second speaking of the ritual of sprinkling that blood. So here again, this different example. In the New Testament, we find the word translated for washing in Hebrews 9.10, speaking of the ablution of Judaism, referring to ceremonial washing of cups, pots, uh, brazen uh, vessels, and of tables. You can read it also in Mark 7, 4. And to the ceremony of water baptism, I wrote it down, you know, Matthew uh, so 3, 7, 3, 7 and 16, uh, and 1 Corinthians 1, 14, 1 Peter, I think, 3, 21. A pure mechanical usage is seen in Luke 16:24, where the rich man asked that Lazarus dip, baptize his finger in water, and cool his tongue. So here again, different examples about the word baptism. The uses of the word, as seen in the above examples, resolve itself into the following definition definition of the word baptizo in its me mechanical uh, meaning. The introduction or placing of a person or thing into a new environment or into union with something else so as to alter its condition or its relationship to its previous environment or condition. And that is the use in Romans 6. It refers to the act of God introducing a believer sinner into final union with Jesus Christ in order that that believer might have the power of his sinful nature broken and the divine nature implanted 
through his identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, thus altering the condition and relationship of that sinner with regard to his previous state and environment, bringing him into a new environment, the kingdom of God. That is what Paul refers to when he says, has translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in Colossians 1, 1.13. We have the same mechanical uses of baptizo in 1 Corinthians 12.13. Did I write it down? Yes, I wrote it down. For by means of the uh, instrumental of one spirit, were we all baptized into one body. When Paul speaks of the act of the Holy Spirit placing or introducing the believer, the believing sinner into the body of Christ, as in our Romans text referred to in the same act, but speak of the head of the body rather than the body itself. The word spirit is in the instrumental case, which case designates the means by which the action in the verb is accomplished. The Holy Spirit is the divine agent who himself baptized, introduced the believer into final union with the Lord Jesus. It should be clear from this that the baptism by means of the Spirit is not for power. Its sole purpose is to unite the believer, or is to unite the believing sinner with the Savior. Power for holy living and for service comes from the fullness of the Spirit. The baptism is an act which takes place at the moment the sinner believes never to be repeated. The fullness is a moment-by-moment -moment continuous state as the believer trusts the Lord Jesus for that fullness. And you can read it in John 7, 37 and 38. So here, uh, I will stop with this because uh, I think you, all, you have better understanding. All he's saying is that water baptism does not save. It's an identification, so to speak. You identify yourself when you're really born again and you're baptized that you, like, you know, are also part of his death and resurrection. It doesn't save. But it's important to show the people what you believe and why you do it. And by doing that, after the testimony, there it goes again, okay, that people will understand, okay, and you are a, a testimony to the people who your Lord is. And that you do believe in a resurrection. You have to remember now, it may, I might repeat certain things, you know, a couple of times, you have to understand there's a lot of people who does not believe there is life after death. So it is important for us as believers to tell the people and to show the people why we believe there is a resurrection. Because of Jesus Christ. And as Christ says in, in Matthew 16, I built my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So here again, that is, in a way, you don't understand, baptism is an introduction of a testimony, but in the same token, it's a command in such a way that you believe in the resurrection. If there's no resurrection, what, what do you have? You die and you die, and you just rot away. But that's not true. Because we have to understand as we, have a, we are made of body and soul and spirit, 
the body goes in the grave and you know it will rot away so to speak but your soul and your spirit will keep on living that's why the bible says we are created in god's image we have a body that means tangible right you can see it but a soul and spirit you don't the beautiful part is the same thing with god God the Son, as a believer, even the unbelievers see him. And the apostles, if you know, many times in the, so our thing in the scripture tells us, I think it's first John, that they saw him, they touched him. Even when Christ was resurrected, he said, God, I mean, he, he showed himself to the apostles, here I am, here's my proof. Put your finger in my side, here on my, you know, in my hand, look at the nails went through it. So they touch is tangible. That is God, but we'll but the, but the, we will we will we will not be able to see God the Father and God the Spirit. That's what that like that's in a nice way he's trying to tell us why we are created in God's image. Don't ever think because of that statement and people use that and I told you that before. That means we are we can become a God. That is not true. That's a lie of the devil. So be very careful. And understand you know and like water right i don't understand people believe that water can space save you it says in in, in hebrews 9 it's not, start even 9 and 14 it says that without shedding of blood there is no remission of sin so what the water has to do then tell me think logically believe the word of god if i if i may suggest Read the whole chapter of Hebrew 9. So beautiful, you know. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Look what he says, the living God. So he is repeating again who Christ is. And for this reason he is the what? The mediator, the mediator of the new covenant. By means of death. For the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant. That those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance when you when you break it down in a nice way okay you, you see over here the old testament has also a new an old covenant may i use the word and you know in the old testament we have priests we have temples here we have a new covenant there is no more priest. That's not so important. And many religions have that. That is contrary to the word of God. There is no more priest. And I shared you before that God, that Christ, He is our high priest. Okay? Once and for all. That's it. In the Old Testament, if you look at it, and I, I share with you about baptism, you know, the cleaning pots and things like that, and cleansing the pots, that was a priest was doing. They has no communication in that respect personally with God. But we do, as a believer, look at First John, you know, uh, seven, 7, 8, or 9. If we confess our sin, that's only for the believer. He's faithful to forgive our sins. How beautiful, beautiful it is. In the Old Testament, when they have a sacrifice, their sins are covered. New Testament, when we really repent, our sins are gone, are forgiven. That's the difference. That's why there are no more priests. And a lot of people have that. In the old original, and they have uh, sacraments. There's no more sacraments. 
see, God does not lie. Or he, he says in, I think in Acts 7, when we're talking about uh, Ste 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 Stephen, or Stephen, when he was died, he says in the same thing, God has no pleasure in a temple built by human hands. Why? Because when you're born again, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6, right, what? That your body becomes the holy temple because the Holy Spirit lives in you permanently and you are sealed until the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30. So put those things together. Scripture interprets scripture. Every true believer is indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And then on top of it, and when you read the Lord's Prayer, we are one with, with God the Father and God the Son. Tells you right there. So I hope you understand how important it is that you don't fall in a trap of wrong teachers who, who tell you something completely contrary to the Word of God. We should rejoice when you are born again Christian for what we are. And Hebrews 4.16, when you're a Christian, what can you do? Only in the Old Testament, once a year, the high priest can only go in the Holy Holiness. But the Bible says what, as a believer? We can come boldly to the throne of God. Yes, as a believer, because God the Father sees in us what? Jesus Christ. So we have the privilege to come to Him boldly and share our feelings to Him. That's the beauty. Now can you imagine that we can come to Almighty God? Think about it and meditate on it. How beautiful and what a privilege it is. I cannot comprehend that. But I accept it because of the Word of God. Not because I want to do it, you know, it's in my mind. No. God says you have the privilege to come when you're really born again. So, folks, I hope you understand where I'm coming from. And that might encourage you. The privilege, that's why Colossians 3 says what? Keep your eyes up to above. Put your mind, not on the earth, but above. Sorry, I have to leave. I hope this will encourage you. If you're not a believer, you give your heart to the Lord and you are assured according to the scripture, you will live eternity forever, forever with Him and not with the enemy. So if you got anything out of my videos, give me a thumb up. If you like to subscribe, please ring the notification bell. And I will say then, until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye.